From 1965 until 2008, the Eastland Missionary Camp in South Dakota served as a place for missionaries to stay when they wanted to take time off, as well as a campground for churches to use for retreats, children's summer camps, and so on. The camp was generally considered to be a fairly quiet place, separate from the noise of the world, as the founder, Reverend Henry Eastland, liked to put it. When I was young, my church would hold a summer camp for children ages 7 through 12. My parents sent me, there, sent me with them several times when I was a kid. Horror stories and summer camp go hand in hand. As much as both the camp staff try to suppress this fact, we all heard our fair share of them. The one we heard the most was the so-called legend of Blackwater Lake. Blackwater Lake was, fair, was a fairly large lake that covered a large portion of the northwest side of the campground. It was on the shores of this lake where larger cabins were built to house church groups and allowed them to be separate from the smaller individual cabins which were rented out for visiting missionaries. If you were to ask the final owner of the camp before it was shut down how the lake had acquired its name, he would tell you that it was named for a missionary named Ezra Blackwater, who was one of Eastland's first and most frequent visitors, supposedly a close friend of the Reverend himself. This is the same story that the previous owner would probably tell you. The truth, however, is that nobody really knows for certain where the lake got its name, except for Reverend Eastland and he died only seven years after the camp opened. All I could say for certain is that my research into the camp records indicates that no one with the name Ezra Blackwater, nor even just the surname, had stayed on the premises. Now that said, prior to Eastland's death, the record keeping of the camp was not exactly up to par. Furthermore, a flooding incident destroyed many of the camp's older records. The more recent records do not indicate that anyone, anyone with the name Ezra Blackwater nor the surname Blackwater had ever stayed on the premises. The more damning evidence, however, is the fact that after checking the archives of the the International Mission Board of North American Mission Board, I was unable to find any listing of an Ezra Blackwater. There is of course the possibility that Blackwater would have been with a different missionary organization, or he might or he might have even been an independent missionary. But considering the massive financial and legal difficulties independent missionaries face, that situation seems unlikely. In addition, Reverend Eastland very rarely associated his church with any mission boards other than the two previously mentioned. Only one thing is certain, as far as any official documentation goes, there does not seem to have been any been a missionary named Ezra Blackwater. No one I know has any solid idea of where the legend started, though after talking to dozens of the camp's attendees, I could safely say that the story has been around in, from, in one form or another since the mid-70s. At this point, it's more or less impossible to say what elements were and were not part of the original story. There are quite a few different variations, while the core plot remains the same throughout the, each retelling. I have heard many ver versions of different key elements. 
But that said, after hearing and retelling, after retelling of the story from countless individuals, some of whom were able to supply me with two or more versions, I've done my best to cobble together a somewhat cohesive version of the tale. From what I could tell, the oldest and the most reoccurring elements. The story begins relatively simply. There was a boy named Tom who came to Eastland Missionary Camp with his Sunday school class. The class was small, only about 25 children in all. And they all planned and they planned to arrive on Monday and leave on Friday. Now, a rule that we always hear over and over again here at camp is that campers are not allowed to leave their cabins after dark without permission from a counselor or in case of an emergency. But Tom was a well-known troublemaker and had been repeatedly forbidden from participating in activities with, with the other campers as punishment. Eventually, he was told that he couldn't go canoeing. Tom became very upset since that, since that was one of the activities he was really looking forward to. So Tom snuck out late at night after he, after he knew everyone was asleep, illuminated by the light of the full moon. He crept over to the shack where the canoes were kept. At the time, there was no lock on the door since the camp was so isolated. With some difficulty, Tom dragged out one of the smaller canoes over to the shore of Blackwater Lake and set off and paddle in hand grinning at his success. Unfortunately, it was very late at night and Tom started to grow tired. Try as he might, he felt his eyelids starting to droop as he began to nod off. Tom had no idea how long he was asleep for, but he was awoken by the canoe bumping into something. Looking around, he quickly saw that the canoe had landed on a tiny isle in the center of Blackwater Lake. Tom stood up, confused. There should not have been an isle anywhere in Blackwater Lake. The moon hung high and bright in the sky, and Tom could see all the points on the shore from the, from the little isle. He walked around its circumference and slowly and carefully. There wasn't much to see here. It mostly appeared to be sand and tall grass. He approached the point on the aisle where the canoe was ra or would rather have been shown. Should have been. <sighs> to Tom's horror and dismay, the canoe had floated off and was now about 20 yards away. He watched as the canoe floated further and further off, knowing that his only option was to try to swim back or just sit and wait for daytime. Either way, he knew he was in big trouble. Tom sat in the sand trying to decide which option was better. He was distracted, however, by a blurry shadow in the reflection of the moon on the water. He blinked and looked up at the moon, thinking it must have been a cloud in the sky, but it was completely clear that night. There was not a cloud in sight. He looked up he looked back at the shadow on the on the lake, realized that it had grown larger. He stared at it to his horror. It was actively becoming bigger and bigger. Soon the already dark lake was completely engulfed in blackness. Tom looked down at the waves hitting the shore on the isle and saw that the water itself had become a murky pitch black. He backed up slowly and glued his eyes on the water. Honestly, this next part is the one I can't quite make heads or tails of, but I've heard over 30 variations of the story, and while each version is more or less has been, pat has been the preceding title, nearly every version I have heard has a different ending. I had never heard the same ending from more than more, more than five different sources. 
There are versions where the story ends with Tom being caught by some kind of aquatic monster or a ghost or a serial killer or in some cases an, an, uh, an amalgamation of the three. The fact remains that nobody can seem to come to an agreement on how the story short it should end. That said, there is only one ending that I heard more than once. Which is to say five times, it goes like this. Early the next morning, the campers and staff found Tom unconscious on the shore of the Black of Blackwater Lake, unconscious and barely breathing. He was rushed to the hospital. After a few hours of work, the doctors were able to bring Tom back, just long enough to recount the story you've just heard. But right when he was about to tell what happened next, he collapsed. Tom was dead. To this day, nobody knows what happened that night on Blackwater Lake. It's an unsatisfactory ending, I know. It's always intrigued me, though. You see, the security at Eastland Missionary Camp was never exactly tight. At least not in the daytime. There would always be some kid who decided to wander off somewhere. Not that he or she ever got very far. But come nightfall, I know for a fact that there were at least 10 people out at time, at all times patrolling the campgrounds. You could always look through the windows to see at night and see people sleeping and walking around with flashlights. And even stranger, there was always one or two people with shotguns. I had always assumed it was in any case any bears, bears show up. But in my research, I found that bears are almost unheard of in this area. Looking, looking back now, there was always a bit of bizarre air at the, to the camp. There were a lot of buildings that seemed run down, and some of them almost seeming like safety hazards. There were at least three chapels on the ground, but there was one that we all knew about, but were, but were told never to enter. I assume it was mo almost definitely on the verge of collapsing. I don't want to jump into conclusions. A lot of the creep factor of Eastland Missionary Camp just came from the fact that it was a very traditional religious camp with very little funding. Honestly, I wouldn't have e I wouldn't even be looking into into it if it hadn't been for an experience I had in 2010, just two years after the camp closed. I was on my way to a friend's house and I had gotten held up due to traffic. I realized that I could take a detour through the town where the camp used to be. I figured I may as well see if it was still around and decided to drive down that way. This was rather stupid, a rather stupid decision since I didn't quite remember where the camp was and by the time I found the road it was on, it was getting completely dark. I was terribly surprised to learn that the camp had been closed down. What I was surprised about, I wasn't terribly surprised about, what I was surprised about was the land was now surrounded by a tall fence lined with barbed wire and I'm certain that I saw people wandering inside it with flashlights. I didn't stick around long. The gate was marked with a restricted area sign and something about being the, being the property of the United States government. Again, I didn't want to jump to conclusions. The obvious answer is that the camp was just condemned or seized by the bank or something. But that doesn't explain all the activity I saw there. It was there that my research started. And it is here that I suppose my research must end. Five years of searching. I started out I started out as a hobby and soon became an obsession. My girlfriend is threatening to leave me if I take this any further. The conclusion I've come to simply that 
if it was something weird that went on at Eastland Missionary Camp, then I'll probably never know what it was. I'll just have to live with that. Still, one thought plagues my mind like a virus refusing to go. I interviewed Reverend Eastland's widow, Louise, in 2020-2010. She was in her 80s and well within the state of dementia. Still, I managed to catch her on what was one of her good days and she gave me a good chunk of information I have of the information I have that it wasn't bothers me that it wasn't bothers me what bothers me is what she said after I brought up how re how the reverend died of a heart attack in the late 1970s she shook up her head and looked at me blankly he didn't have a heart attack she said they found him on the shore of Blackwater Lake. She refused to speak with me any further after that. Well, that was a very good creepypasta right there. A very good one. It kind of really shows about the kind of myths that you can hear whenever your younger days when you go into summer camp or something like that. And, it, it really does have a nice interest in. I'm not sure what kind of I'm not sure what happened to that boy Tom in the in the story but something must have killed him or something or dragged him out onto the water don't know what it was maybe we'll never know it's probably one of those mysteries that's best left unsolved and in that in that part at the end about how uh how Eastland's widow said that he that the Reverend was found on the shore of Blackwater Lake. I wonder if there's some kind of connection here that both Tom and this and the Reverend what might be the same person. Maybe we'll never know. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. But anyways, feel free to comment, rate, and favorite this video. Subscribe to my channel, look me up on Facebook. And this is Marshall Dion signing off for now.